Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, for the courtesy of your attention. Um, I have been asked to consider the interplay between politics and regulation. And I understand this is an on-the-record event and journalists may be present, so my press office told me that I shouldn't say everything I plan to say. Um, I'll do this uh, in the, well, I probably will. Um, I'll do this in the context of independence of regulation. I think that's the most important thing. Um, let's have a brief reminder first. Why are economic regulators independent, and other institutions, but economic regulators independent so that political criteria do not intrude into decisions which need to be based on economic engineering and other non-political criteria. Political horizons are far too short for some of the decisions that need to be taken even though they are in the public interest. Not everything goes uh, well with politicians. Independence comes from, usually, the absence of political criteria in the regulator's statutory remit and statutory duties. It comes from the absence of a power of direction in the hands of ministers or other political institutions to tell the regulatory authority what to do or not to do. The absence of a right of appeal to the minister if you don't like the regulator's decision. And the absence of the power of the minister to dismiss the regulator on grounds other than the narrowest ones, which are pretty much the same as high court judges, namely incapacity or misbehavior. Disagreeing with the minister does not count. Now, the, the papers that we were given at the beginning talks about the blurred boundaries between elected politicians and independent institutions. And yes, they can be blurred, but sometimes they can be so fragile and so brittle that they will fracture if they are put under undue pressure. And that's what sometimes happens. But let us also bear in mind that when the industries in question were in public hands, when they were nationalized industries, ministers had far fewer specific powers over those industries than the newly created economic regulators were to have when the industries were reorganized for privatization and then eventually put into the private sector. And there is sometimes detected a jealousy, a boiling jealousy, of civil servants and central government departments when they look at the powers the regulators have. And that is an important dynamic. And that gets intensified when the regulatory authorities don't tell the central government departments in question what they're planning to do, why they're going to do it, and when they're going to do it, or whether they're not going to do it. And that kind of communication which I think is highly desirable that there should be two-way communication between the host government department and the regulatory authority, but it can only really take place if there's a re relationship of trust. And the Department for Transport in my time made it abundantly clear that I could not trust them. There is a, and again, this is not widespread, but these are my observations from my experience as a regulator. I can talk in the question session about what it's like with the police. And I have to say, the police are completely different from the railways um, in all sorts of ways that we could discuss. But there is sometimes in the hands of politicians a refusal, deliberate or otherwise, to understand why the institutions in question are independent or a refusal to respect that independence. I'm elected, you're not. So what I say has to go. I'll come back to that. Now, independence has two elements, legal and behavioral, and you need both. Your legal independence comes from your statutory remit. It is what it is. Parliament could change the law and take away that independence, but until it does, it's there. And then there's behavioral independence. And I remember writing to my immediate successors, and Anna was not one of my immediate successors, I was the last single-person regulator for the railways. When I left, they changed it into a board of 12 people with a non-executive chair and a full-time chief executive, and it was good to know that all these years I've been doing the work of 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I wrote a letter to my successors, and I said this. It is extremely important that when you are faced with a decision which the industry and others know you would take in one way, and you take it in a different way because it is clear you are doing it according to political, in other words, improper, illegally irrelevant criteria, 
When you show through your behavior they are not really independent, irrespective of your legal remit, your independence will have gone and you will never get it back. It took my immediate successor six months to do exactly what I warned them not to do. There is a political intolerance and impatience with industries that are performing badly, principally with the performance of the industries or the companies under the jurisdiction of the regulators. So when things are going wrong, things get much hotter. So the best thing for a regulator to do is, a, is to do a conspicuously good job. Be ahead of the companies in question, know what's going on, see what's going wrong before it goes wrong, and then take a prompt and appropriate action to do everything within your power <coughs> to prevent it happening. Sometimes that'll be impossible, most of the time it is possible. But events sometimes overwhelm. The Hatfield rail crash took place on the 17th of October 2000. Four men died, 56 people were injured, some of them seriously, and the railway network went into meltdown. The rail track threw on 1,200 emergency speed restrictions all over the network, mainly because they did not know where else a rail might break under a train going at high speed somewhere on their network. So there was, it was a catastrophic breakdown in the operational integrity of the network. And what happened? The politicians got really, really upset about that. Now, why didn't we, the regulatory authority, know that that might happen? Because pretty much to the day when the Hatfield train crash took place, I had made my final decision in the first periodic review, I must be the only regulator to do two quinquennial reviews in the space of four years. I had made my final decision to increase the financial settlement of rail track from 10 to 14.8 billion pounds. But that had to be on the basis of the information that we had at the time about the condition, capacity, capability, serviceability, performance of the network. And when I got into office, I was staggered at how little the regulatory authority really knew about those things. And why was that, I asked my new colleagues, and that's because RailTrack don't have the information themselves. What are you doing to ensure that you can get that information? Answer, don't know, well, have you got any ideas, Tom? Well, we, we immediately amended their network license to require them to produce an asset register and lots of other things, but that takes time. There's 20,000 kilometers of railway network. There are 90,000 bridges over the network, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can't produce one of these overnight. So I was pretty appalled about that, but we had to make the decision on the basis of the information we had. And guess what? It wasn't enough money because the condition of the network was worse, and therefore they needed more money. Well, that was far too slow for the politicians. And their political impatience with the performance of the railway boiled over, intensified by a visceral hatred of the touring privatization of the railways and rail track in particular. <coughs> so they saw their chance. So they devised, in the Treasury principally, Stephen Byers, anybody remember him? <laughs> Stephen Byers was the Secretary of State for Transport at the time, and he was, in my opinion, the instrument of the Treasury. This was not his plan. This was far too, con <laughs> it's far too sophisticated. So there was a Treasury plan uh, to take back the track, the old union slogan, time to take back the track. And they came up with a cunning plan, wasn't that cunning, cunning plan to achieve renationalization of the railway network without paying any money for it at all. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. They end up paying pretty close to the pre-closing share price of rail track after they carried out what was effectively a political assassination of a FTSE 100 company. Now, you may not mourn the victim, but you can mourn the manner of his passing. And RailTrack, for all its faults, did not deserve to be put to death in that way. The plan was illegal. Lies were told to a High Court judge in order to secure the plan. And it initially, it appeared to work. They put the company into railway administration because they told the company it was, in, they told the judge it was insolvent. It wasn't insolvent. But they withheld, or rather one particular individual, withheld information from the court in order to secure the result in question. Well, I think that was just dreadful. And if anybody wants to see more of that, read Hansard for the 24th of October 2005. 
um, the debate on the collapse of rail track for some of the detail. But people talk about the legitimacy of regulators. So th the story I've just very briefly told is about the collapse of rail track and the Im political impatience with the company. And the one thing that could stop the cunning plan working was the power of the independent regulator to restore the solvency of rail track, assuming it was insolvent, which it wasn't. And so I was called into Stephen Byer's office <coughs> on a Friday afternoon after the stock market finished and was told that uh, the company was insolvent, they'd done a lot of work over the summer, and they were going to court on Sunday afternoon to put the company into administration. And the only criterion for going into administration was the company was insolvent. So I was a bit stunned by that, and I said to Mr. Byers, um, well, I'm its economic regulator, I've just increased its revenues by 4.8 billion pounds, and uh, if the company was on the precipice of insolvency. I would know about that. Well, what they tell you is different, but we are satisfied. So I said, well, the, does the chairman of RailTrack know this? No, he's coming in after you and we're gonna tell him then. He said, well, if I were the chairman of RailTrack hearing this news, I would immediately apply to the rail regulator to advance the interim review of my financial affairs because <laughs> that deal crashed, we'd had to promise a reopener. I would ask him to advance the the financial review so as to restore my solvency. Yeah, we thought of that, said Byers. And if they apply to you over the weekend for the acceleration of that financial review, he said, I have the authority of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to introduce emergency legislation into Parliament to take you, the regulator, under direct political control. <laughs> and after pausing to consider whether I'd really heard what I'd heard, I asked if that would be in relation to all my powers or just, just the power to do the financial review. He said it would be in relation to everything, competition law, everything, but its first use would be to prevent the review proceeding. I then gave him a long list of reasons why that'd be a really bad idea, including the independence of all the other regulators as well as private investment in the railway industry, the independence of the Bank of England, the government's reputation for respecting the sanctity of contract, everything, but they weren't listening. They decided to do it and so they did it. RailTrack did not oppose the application the administration order, and they went quietly into that long, dark night. The date chosen for the, uh, for the action, just curious coincidence, happened to be the day on which the RAF and the US Air Force began bombing in Af Afghanistan. Purest coincidence. But it was still on the front page of the papers for a long time afterwards. So that's political impatience and a willingness to take violent political action against an independent regulator if he had the temerity to stand up to their plan. So the next day, RailTrack called me up and said, listen, we came to you tonight, would you do the review? And I said, yeah, of course I will. But I need to know how much money do you need um, and what are the grounds of the review? How much money do you need and, how, and, when, and when do you need it? And they said, well, the grounds of the review are the yawning gap between what you just gave us and what we really need and the burgeoning cost of the West Coast Main Line, which had gone from 2.2 to 13.8 billion pounds, which is not a small overrun. Mm. How much money do you need? Hundreds of millions of pounds, said the chairman. Turned out to be 7.4 billion. When do you need the money Monday? Well, come on. So I said, look, I can give you, a, I can give you a, a letter. You can show it to the judge tomorrow. And saying, I've started the review. And he will not make the administration order. They didn't want the letter. They just went quietly. Well, there was a hell of a political row as a result of that. The administration of RailTrack lasted for four times as long as they projected. And in order to get the company out of administration, they had to go back to the High Court and say, this company is solvent. And what is the grounds of saying that it's solvent? And they said, well, there's an independent regulator and he's going to do a financial review. <laughs> exactly the same powers that they threatened me with legislation to extinguish if I had the temerity to start the review, which I was willing to do, but RailTrack wouldn't take it. Well, that's that story. Now, people rail against unelected institutions. I mentioned at the beginning, you're not elected and I am. See, I did do the review that I promised RailTrack and we, we increased the financial settlement from 14.8 to 22.2 billion pounds. That's an extra 7.4 billion, a lot of money. And I remember Alistair Darling, who was by then Secretary of State for Transport because buyers didn't survive, and he got really cross with me. Now, getting any emotion out of Alistair Darling is a major achievement, but anger was the one I got. <laughs> and I'm sure he's a very emotional man. Uh, he was very cross. 
and the, and the tenor of the conversation was, I'm elected and you're not. Well, when Parliament takes away my jurisdiction, that's fine for Parliament to do, but my powers come from the authority of Parliament, not from the whim of a minister. But I don't think that that really bites with some people. And sometimes there's an argument about unelected judges. How many of times have you heard the newspaper say, oh, these unelected judges, how dare they be making up the law and thwarting the will of Parliament and all the rest of it. Legally, utterly illiterate, as you will gather. But they, they rail against them, and they hold up, actually, the European Court of Human Rights as an example, blissfully ignoring the fact that these are the only judges with jurisdiction in this country who are elected. But why <laughs> let the facts get in the way? So the possession of very considerable power intensifies the risk that politicians will intrude, particularly when things go wrong, or they think you're going to make a decision that they really don't like. And they, there's also a risk that the nature and the source and the purposes of the power of the independent regulator will be misrepresented. And that is an ex extremely dangerous thing as well. I was at a conference, I'm going to come to an end now because I'm almost out of time. Um, more than out of time, I'm so sorry. Um, We're enjoying it though. <laughs> I'll, I'll, there, there, I was at a conference sometime later and the, the, one of the other economic regulators said at a, at a public, confer pu public conference, he said, look, you know, I'm not elected, the minister is. I know that my statutory duties do not include pri political criteria, but because he's elected, he has a higher democratic legitimacy than I do. Therefore, if I believe that my statutory duties point in one direction, but the, pol the, the minister wants me to do something else, I will defer to the minister because he's elected. And I said to him, come on, your power comes from the highest source of democratic legitimacy, namely parliament. There's nowhere higher. After all, I added, we live in a system under the rule of law. And he said, I regard the rule of law as a scary concept. <laughs> With regulators like that, you don't really need to worry about legal independence and so on. When you've got regulators with the DNA of deference, the genetic matrix of obedience, it's heaven for the ministers. So the moral of the story finally is independent economic regulation requires really good nerves. You need to be true to yourself and to your statutory remit. Discard any hopes of being reappointed. It might happen, but don't, don't count on it. And certainly don't change your behavior in order to do it or other favors of patronage. Good communi communi communication between you and the host government department and a relationship of trust <coughs> with politicians is highly desirable, but it really does take two to tango. And the more important is the relationship with the public. Because when the public trusts you, it is much harder for the politicians to um, dis destabilize you and assault you. Now that may have some it may very well be that the regulator could even become more trusted by the public than the politician. That may have some validity in the short term. And that includes making really big decisions knowing that they can't be undone, but that they won't be able to be repeated. Voltaire said it right when he said, it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. So be prepared, <laughs> regulators. Get your reforms dug well in with reinforced concrete and blast-proof covers as early as possible in your term of office so that they cannot be reversed by your successors who may be more politically deferential or just plain neglectful. And for reforming regulators, it's also apposite to bear in mind that revolutions often devour their own children. In more modern times, I prefer the words of the Northampton Mercury in its obituary of Sir Robert Peel, the father of modern policing, when he said, there are some victories which are necessarily fatal to the conqueror. So bear that in mind. In my own case, the repose of my regulatory soul lasted only eight years. And my Lazarine resurrection required a change of government, of course. Labour government wouldn't have appointed me to be a school crossing patrolman after what I did. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow cabinet minister who ferociously defended my independence and defended my defence of my independence in Parliament at the time of that shocking uh, business of the collapse of Railtrack 
became Home Secretary in 2010. So the sun can rise in the West sometimes. 